Good afternoon. Happy holidays to you. It's a great day here at Elvon Associates and welcome to our webinar series. Today's topic is understanding the uses and purposes of irrevocable trusts in 2023 and beyond, presented by Elvon Associates Managing Principal and Lead Attorney Stephen Elville. My name is Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director at Elvon Associates, and I'll be your moderator today. You're at the right place for high-level legal education. We encourage your general questions today, so please note them in the chat or the questions panel on your screen, and we'll pause periodically to address them. Your questions add value and help others learn, so pose your questions at any time. You received the presentation slides by email from me yesterday to take notes on them if you wish. These materials are also available in the section marked handouts in the panel on your screen to download at this time. For our professionals on today's webinar, a warm welcome as well. 1.5 continuing education hours are available for most everyone in attendance. If you'd like to submit an ID number and your accreditation for me to provide a certificate of attendance or submit your information to the CFP Board of Standards, please send that information to me today if I don't have it already. Everyone will also receive a post-webinar feedback email right after the presentation, so please take just a couple of minutes to fill out this very brief survey to offer us your feedback about today's presentation. And as always, we read and value every comment that you have to offer. We have several presentations coming up in February and March that are a direct result of your survey comments. So thank you for your attention to that. In this season of giving, give yourself the gift of planning and security. Here at Elvon Associates, we wanna be a resource to your family and you. If you have planning needs to address, old documents that need to be reviewed or another matter, Consider a consultation and use today's education as a jumping off point to get your planning started. Consultations are by far the most ideal way to have Steve understand your specific situation, get your specific questions answered, and have Steve offer solutions and a path forward for you. So today, relax, listen, learn, enjoy, and take action today. I'd like to offer Steve and the firm a brief yet proper introduction before we get started, and then we will jump right into the material. So you should be able to see my screen here. Elbow and Associates, founded in 2010 by Stephen Elville here in Columbia. We have several different practice areas that we offer here at the firm, including estate and special needs planning, elder law and elder care planning, estate and trust administration, business law and succession planning, guardianship and litigation, tax planning and asset protection. We have nine attorneys, 12 staff members, and five locations. Steve and I are coming to you live from the Columbia Gateway Community location today. Our mission, as it always has been and always will be, is to provide practical solutions to our clients' needs through counseling, client education, and superior legal technical knowledge. We focus on education a lot here at Elvin Associates. We do that in several ways through our planning processes with our clients, through educational webinars and workshops in the communities that we serve each year, and also by way of our accredited client care program. We're one of only two firms in Maryland to have an accredited client care program through the Client Care Academy in Boston. We also focus on the ideals of client education, collaboration, and compassion in mind with every client every day here at Elbel and Associates. Just a bit about Steve. His work as an attorney for the past 23 years has been centered in elder law, special needs planning, and estate planning, with an emphasis in the areas of tax planning and asset protection. A member of many different national membership organizations, including the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, the Academy of Special Needs Planners, and the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys. He works to bring peace of mind to clients by offering solutions to their needs through counseling, client education, and the use of leading edge legal technical knowledge. A very seasoned speaker, if you haven't heard Steve present before, offering many, many webinars, workshops for businesses and their employees, conferences, and continuing education events each year. Steve was named to the Maryland Super Lawyers List for an eighth time in 2023 and a seventh consecutive year. We'll see what 2024 has to bring in just a few days. He also had a feature story written about him in the National Super Lawyers Magazine about the Elville Center for the Creative Arts, which is our firm's charitable organization he founded in 2014. And I'm very privileged and fortunate to be the executive director of. If you'd like to learn more about the Elville Center and what we do to make a musical difference in the lives of children in our communities each day, 
please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be very happy to share our story with you when we have just a bit more time. Today, we're talking all about irrevocable trusts. What are they? How mysterious are they? I think Steve's going to shed some light on them today. Steve, I'm going to make you the presenter. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. My pleasure. There is the button, and I'm going to take charge of the screen. And uh, Jeff, you should be able to see my slideshow. I do. All right. I thank you, Jeff, again, and welcome everyone uh, to our webinar this afternoon. Good afternoon. And I'm looking out my window here in Columbia from our conference room number one, and I see it's somewhat overcast, but it is the holidays. And uh, I thank you for taking time out of your very, very busy Wednesday to spend time with us today, right in the middle of the business day. So uh, thank you for doing that for both uh, uh, potential clients, uh, existing clients, and also professionals uh, who are on the call here that are in the middle of your busy day. Thank you for taking the time and supporting our webinar series. Now, I couldn't help but notice, as I'm thinking about the holidays, that Jeff is wearing a red shirt today with a matching uh, somewhat red tie. So Jeff, well done uh, to get into the spirit of the holidays. And Jeff, do you mind me sharing uh, something that you said to me the other day that you actually are done all of your Christmas shopping already? Is that actually true? <laughs> Steve, when you start in September, you have to be finished by now. All right. Well, I have to say that's quite impressive. So uh, anyway, happy holidays to you, Jeff, and to everybody. Uh, and just wanted to let everybody know that fun fact about Jeff. Well, Steve, today every day is Christmas in my life. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Well, uh, as we get into the material here today, uh, you said it aptly, Jeff, that the understanding of the uses and purposes of irrevocable trust in 2023 and beyond. So. The theme of this workshop today, which is backed by popular demand, uh, we just did this workshop recently and many people asked us to present again. So that's why we're back talking about this and going into 2024 now, we want to have uh, the full use of what I would call in estate planning, all of our tools and weapons, so to speak, all of those things that are available to you in the world of irrevocable trust. And we're going to get into this a little bit more in the webinar itself, but Many people say, what is an irrevocable trust? And I think for purposes of today, even though this time that we have together is somewhat limited, I would, for purposes of this webinar, think about irrevocable trusts as trusts with a special purpose. And that's what I'm going to be asking you about today is, as you think about this, uh, this subject and you want to gain in knowledge about this subject, I would ask you to think if you're a client or potential client, uh, do you have something in mind as far as a special concern of yours? This could be taxes. It could be a loved one with special needs. It could be uh, using your gift tax exemption. It could be understanding what a gifting trust is. Maybe some of you have life insurance policies and life insurance trusts, and you're wondering, should I continue to use those or should I have a new one? Or what are the uses and purposes of these trusts? But this is all going to be driven by individual goals. What are my goals? What are my concerns? So uh, we're going to start here in just a second with that. But if you're an advisor, uh, a financial advisor or a professional on this webinar today and you're getting your CLE and thank you for supporting our series, uh, I also want you to ask yourself, are there practice areas or subject matter areas that you're weak in like we all are? and we want to sure up our knowledge in certain areas, and there might be things that are specific to your potential questions about your own you know, specific areas of interest that you would like to sure up. So again, I would like you to think about this webinar as a very broad topic of the uses and purposes of irrevocable trust, mainly what is out there that is available to be used to solve problems, to get us to go from point A to point B, to solve the problem or the particular goal or the particular concern that we have, whatever that may be. And of course, this list of trusts that we're going to talk about today is not exclusive. These are not the only trusts that are available, but a good general overview of the tools and weapons in estate planning that we have available to us as we enter this very exciting time of a new year with large exemption amounts for federal and state estate tax and favorable income tax atmosphere, at least for trusts and so forth. So with that said, we're going to get started, and I thank you again for your support. Now, of course, we're talking about very high-level educational material here. We're not talking about 
uh, attorney-client privileged information. Uh, so anything that we say here today is really not meant as legal advice. And the last thing I would like to say before I actually get started, because many of you on this webinar are going to be under the impression that you must be able to consult with me or you may be able to reach me if you have questions. But I also want to say that thanks to people like Jeff, who are uh, one of the major contributors to our staff, all of the staff and attorneys at Elville and Associates, we have six attorneys and three special and, and uh, of counsel attorneys. I could not do what I do at Elville and Associates or have accomplished whatever I've accomplished in this business and, and in our practice without them. So I want you to know that we have many resources here at Elville and Associates other than me. And I am uh, just a person here that's part of a bigger picture of helping clients to get where they need to go and accomplish their goals. Now, as we start, I'm gonna give a little overview here, and then we're gonna stop and take about a 60 second test of uh, things I want you to be thinking about. So estate planning in 2023 and 2024, uh, again, I alluded to that we're in a very favorable period of time where the, uh, the, the, the onerous tax proposals that were put out in um, all during 2021 uh, never went anywhere. Uh, the uh, advantages of planning and many different aspects that were gonna be taken away in 2021 that stalled in the legislature and in the Senate, uh, uh, in the House in, in late 2021, those never went through. We still have a very favorable tax environment. Uh, the sunset of the estate tax laws is not supposed to occur until the end of 2025. So for example, this morning, we were on a call with a client who has a taxable estate and we were talking about making further gifts in 2024, but we also know that we do seem to have plenty of time to be thinking about that. So from a planning perspective, we're in a good position and we have continuing a uh, good uh, time to think about these things subject to any legislative changes in the future. Clients should care about irrevocable trusts in 2023 and 2024, just because as I mentioned from the outset, we have many different goals that we can accomplish through irrevocable trust planning. And we're going to talk about those and you may wanna avail yourself of these things. Uh, what is the difference between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust? We're gonna talk about that. And what are the most common trusts that are available, the irrevocable ones in 2023 going on to 2024? And what are the uses and objectives of these trusts, of course? And we're going to go through a, brief, a very brief tax overview of how trusts are taxed. We won't be able to get into the full-fledged details of that today. And we're gonna talk about the need for flexibility, the various ways that trusts can be amended and how that continues to be evolved in newer trusts building in that flexibility versus older trusts and the need to be able to change those trusts if we need to. Now, before we go any further, I would like to just take about 60 seconds to pose the question that I raised early on. And that is many of you on this webinar today are clients or potential clients. And I want you to be thinking over the next 60 seconds and I'm gonna hit my timer here. What are some of the things that I intuitively feel concerned about that perhaps irrevocable trust planning might solve for me? And if that's too specific, what are my general estate planning concerns right now as we end out 2023? And I'm gonna start my timer and use my iPhone here. And for advisors and professionals on the, on the webinar here today, over the next 60 seconds or so, could you identify why you might be feeling a little bit lacking in certain areas of knowledge when it comes to estate planning or irrevocable trust planning and what could we do or what could you do or what might you need to ask to be able to get up to speed where you would like to be about these particular areas. Let's take just a few more seconds to think through that. Many of you come to these webinars with client issues, if you're a professional, uh, some of you come with uh, family issues or concerns that you've experienced over time and that you've just never been able to uh, address. We have about 10 or 15 more seconds on this. And I hope you're using your old fashioned pad of paper or your, um, or your tablet or your computer, whatever it is that you might be making notes with today. All right, thank you for participating in that exercise with me. And I promise as we go through today, 
I'm going to be giving some some a um, little bit of uh, background through stories that I'll tell about certain trusts to try to be more illustrative. So as I mentioned, we continue to go through a legislative stasis, which is actually a good thing with regard to the current state of estate planning in this country. Uh, the current exemption from federal estate tax is 12920000 It will adjust upwards next year. Uh, the the uh, state estate tax exemption is $5 million per person, but we are on the lookout for the real possibility of a sunset of a cutting in half of the federal exemption on January 1st of 2026 and adjusted for inflation, we expect that to be about 6.8 million per person. On the state estate tax level, it will remain to be seen whether the state of Maryland will lower its exemption and that just remains to be seen. But we need to be on the lookout for that and we need to keep that in mind in the next uh, 24 months or so. Uh, the cost basis adjustment at death, the step up in basis as we call it, continues to survive that was not eliminated in 2021, thank goodness. And the maximum tax rates remain unchanged for right now. The use of grantor trusts, and we're gonna get into that in a minute, the very important use of grantor trusts and their advantages remains unchanged, and the estate and gift tax rates remain unchanged. So we have continued opportunities for basic and advanced planning, um, the inevitable changes, we have, again, a couple more uh, years before we have to worry about that too much. So this is a good time to start to think about what are my goals and what is my estate? Is it taxable? Do I need to be making uh, plans and be flexible in my estate to avoid estate tax um, or you know, other goals that I have? Uh, so we've talked about some of these things, these unprecedented exemption amounts, the use of grantor trust, which we're going to get into more uh, detail. Life insurance as a tool, we may see as a resurgence of life insurance as a good planning tool, uh, even though it continues to be a planning tool. We call life insurance the Swiss Army knife of planning. And we want to take the time to think through these issues. We don't want to be reactive. We want to start talking about them before the pressure is on for more legislative changes, whether that be to the exemption amounts or to our planning and how the actual laws are uh, uh, situated uh, for IRS purposes and in the world of trusts and estates as to whether or not we will continue to have this flexibility. So what is the difference between a revocable and an irrevocable trust? Well, in the interests of time today, a revocable trust, which many of you on this webinar have, is merely a tool it's an alternative to a will. It's a substitute for a will. If you go into a lawyer's office to do basic uh, uh, estate planning, we're either gonna be planning with wills or a will substitute, the revocable living trust. It avoids probate if it is properly funded and aligned with assets, but it offers no asset protection, no income tax savings, and it can be changed at any time. And this is why Uncle Sam says, this is a grantor trust. So for those of you who are just trying to get your minds around these concepts, think of a revocable trust as the simplest form of a grantor trust. The grantor pays the income tax and the trust gets ignored. So the grantor pays the income tax just like they used to before they had a trust. And now as we start to think about more irrevocable trust in this presentation, you'll keep in the back of your mind that a grantor trust can also be uh, an irrevocable trust. Not all irrevocable trusts can be grantor trust, but if we can make a trust a grantor trust, it's generally thought that is a great and more many may, uh, greatly advantageous thing to do. So a trust that is a grantor trust is basically ignored for income tax purposes by Uncle Sam, and obviously this is an advantage versus a non-grantor trust, which we will talk about later. Now, an irrevocable trust, again, I said from the outset, this is a trust that is best described as one that has a special purpose. Now, I think that's a very simple way of thinking about it. Uh, it could be a special purpose of any kind that we're gonna talk about here about the various trusts, but these trusts avoid probate. Uh, they can provide, can provide asset protection for the beneficiaries, an irrevocable trust can, create, can be created during life or at death. The simplest way of understanding an irrevocable trust is a trust that's created at death for someone else. 
but we're going to talk about that. And as I just mentioned, it may be a grantor trust or it could be a non-grantor trust. So for example, just kind of wading into the water here a little bit, that trust I just mentioned that is established at death, that is a non-grantor trust. That is a trust that's irrevocable and pays its own tax versus the grantor paying the tax. And assets, and now we're talking about estate tax planning, assets can be removed from the estate of the grantor and it can be done in various ways with certain techniques that have to do with the powers and the structure of certain irrevocable trusts and certain income tax advantages. So the most common trusts that are available in 2023 going into 2024, and remember this list is not exclusive, are irrevocable spendthrift trusts created at death. Well, that's a mouthful. So irrevocable trust created a death, and that was the one that I just kind of hinted at about many trusts that you may have already established in your will or your trust. So if you're married or if you're not married and you have kids, or even if you don't have kids, you have uh, nieces or nephews or anyone that you want to leave a trust for at your death, and that could be a spouse, that could be, if properly constructed, an irrevocable spendthrift trust at death, meaning a trust at your death that is going to provide asset protection for someone. A lifetime gifting trust, we're gonna get into more details about that. A life insurance trust that I alluded to. A spousal lifetime access trust, boy, that's a big mouthful. That is a very popular trust today that we're going to get into. Charitable trusts, uh, these are tried and true. The IRS is very consistent about these. These are wonderful tools. Of course, today we have donor advised funds and other things that could substitute uh, for certain charitable trusts, but we wanna be aware of a charitable trust. Medicaid trusts and veterans trusts. We wanna know what's going on there in the world of elder law with these particular irrevocable trusts. Marital trusts that we sometimes call Q-tip trusts uh, in many cases, and then other times we are using non-marital trusts, which are called bypass trusts. So we're gonna talk about these. These are trusts usually created at death for a surviving spouse, but not always created at death. So we're gonna talk about that. Grantor retained annuity trusts. These are tools for estate tax planning, not in lump sum uh, ways of you know, hitting a big uh, home run for estate tax planning, but in many ways chipping away at a taxable estate and getting assets out of the estate of a person that has too much money for purposes of estate tax. Special needs trusts. Tr special needs trusts have to do with planning for a loved one with special needs, and these trusts can cre be created during life or at death, and these trusts can be created during life as revocable trust or irrevocable trust. Minors trust. Now, we don't see these too often today. Uh, education trusts, of course, can be very, very important to people as they get older and they want to provide a legacy of education gifting. Dynasty trusts. These trusts are um, in concept, any trust that really lasts forever in perpetuity. Now, these trusts are, are drafted a certain way. Sometimes they can be at death. Sometimes they can be established during life. And domestic asset protection trusts. Now, these are trusts established under the laws of various states. Maryland, for example, is not a domestic asset protection state like our neighbors in Delaware. And of course we have about 17, 16 or 17 of these asset protection states. And I'll just name a few, Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, uh, Alaska, uh, South Dakota. These are places where people can engage in the kind of higher level asset protection that is afforded by some of these states. This does not mean that they have bulletproof asset protection but it means that these types of states and their jurisdictions and laws are available to us if we wish to use them. And one of the types of asset protection trusts is called a special power of appointment trust. Uh, these trusts versus a domestic asset protection trust or a hybrid trust, they come in different varieties. Some of them are more airtight, so to speak, uh, in protecting assets than others, although there may be no such thing as a truly airtight uh, asset protection trust, and then community property trust. These are states, there's about three states in the country that allow us to utilize their jurisdiction 
and be able to take advantage of the income tax advantages of a community property state, even though Maryland, for example, is not a community property state like California. So in community property states, spouses have unique income tax advantages, and uh, in these states, we can take advantage of those where we have uh, a situation that might be applicable. Continuing now just a little bit further, qualified domestic trusts. These are trusts that are established for situations where we have a non-citizen spouse. So this is a very important thing in estate planning. A qualified personal residence trust. This is a trust that can be established for a usually a second home, but even can be established for a primary residence. We don't see them used too often today, but this is still a viable estate tax planning tool where a residence can be gifted at a discounted rate and it can be discounted for estate tax purposes. A crummy trust, just to try to keep us all uh, smiling today, a crummy trust is a trust that has certain income tax advantages when we are funding the trust, uh, and I should say actually gift tax advantages when we are able to make gifts, and I'll go into greater detail. A quiet trust is a trust where a trust a beneficiary doesn't necessarily have the right to notice or information. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit. And then a standalone retirement plan trust. Many of our clients are uh, building wealth in great quantities with uh, retirement plans. And then uh, prior to the SECURE Act, the standalone retirement trust was used quite often. Not so much now, but it's still a trust that we should be familiar with. Now, let's get into the various types of trusts in more detail. And I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the purposes and so forth and get into a little bit more of the weeds. But before I do that, Jeff, I'm just gonna check in with you very quickly. Uh, Jeff is a wonderful moderator. If you have questions, please ask him in the chat. Uh, Jeff is always good at stopping me at the appropriate times. And Jeff is also a resource to you to make sure that you, if you have, uh, uh, technical problems or anything that he can field those problems. Jeff, do we have any questions before I continue to forge ahead? Uh, thank you, Steve. No questions as of yet. I'm sure they'll be coming as we move forward though. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for your continued attention. So now we're talking about trusts for spouses. So let's talk about irrevocable spendthrift trusts at death. And these could be trusts for spouses. It could be children, grandchildren, nieces or nephews. So imagine that you're establishing a will or a revocable trust or even an irrevocable trust. And now at the, at the termination of that trust or at, the, at your death, whatever the termination a time is, this trust is establishing another trust for someone else. So let's take a will or a revocable trust. And on the death of one spouse in a marital situation, it creates a marital trust for the survivor. So if we leave everything in a marital trust, and I'll do my best to illustrate with my hands here, we're leaving assets in what we call the marital share. It qualifies for the unlimited marital deduction. If you don't remember all of this today, do not worry about it. You will know 90% more than anyone you know about irrevocable trusts, so don't worry about it. But that marital trust is going to provide asset protection for the survivor. It's also going to protect for remarriage purposes and this is all a matter of making sure that that's structured properly. So most people today, most average people in normal situations would use the unlimited marital deduction or use this marital trust, or they would leave assets outright to the survivor. And that's gonna be the most advantageous way of leaving assets for income tax purposes and estate tax purposes for the average person. But it's not going to be the right thing for everyone. So there is planning where at the death of one spouse, everything goes to the non-marital share, which is a bypass trust, we call it. And in the past, this trust had various names, the residuary trust, the credit shelter trust, and so forth. But now in modern terms, we call this the bypass trust. Either the marital trust or the bypass trust uh, provides asset protection. And in a marital trust, only the surviving spouse can be the beneficiary. But in a bypass trust, a surviving spouse and children, let's say, can be the beneficiary. But the marital trust gets a step up in basis and a second step up in basis at the death of a surviving spouse. Whereas a bypass trust does not get two steps up in basis, 
it only gets one. So we're usually using these for marital control and we're using them uh, to also achieve asset protection. But these are non-grantor trusts, meaning trusts that are going to pay their own income tax and they're going to have their own tax return, they're going to have their own tax ID number after our deaths. So if these are constructed properly, it's a very, very solid way to leave asset protection, but just getting you familiar with this very common tool and one of the most common ones here, other than trust for children and grandchildren, is the marital trust, although the marital and bypass trust uh, can be pretty much alternately used in various situations. Now let's talk about a lifetime gifting trust. Why would somebody do this? Now, I call it a lifetime gifting trust. Some people might just call this an irrevocable trust for the benefit of someone, like a child. And you establish this during your life, and this could be just a simple trust where you leave an annual exclusion gift. So what is the annual exclusion right now from, from uh, gift tax? 17,000 per person per, per year. And a split between spouses, we could leave up to 34,000 uh, per couple to a particular individual per year. And it does not use any of our gift tax exemption. So a lifetime gifting trust might be something that makes you feel good to make a gift to someone, but it's still in trust. It is protected from the claims of creditors, but it allows you to use your annual exclusion. All right, so that's a lifetime gifting trust. But now I'm going to uh, kind of digress a little bit. Remember I said that a marital trust could be a Q-tip trust. That means a qualified terminal interest property trust. Now, if your eyes are rolling back right now, uh, just take a sip of coffee, even though it's early afternoon, and I promise we will get through this. So when one spouse dies and leaves a marital trust for the survivor, Uncle Sam basically says, we're going to give this couple an advantage that we don't get not give non-married people. We are going to allow the deceased spouse to leave assets in trust for the survivor, for marital protection, for asset protection, but we are going to give the deceased spouse the ability to control those assets. And so that is a big exception for Uncle Sam, to allow the deceased person to and still have it taxed in the estate of the surviving spouse. Well, what this is saying is we can do that during life. So one of the big things that we can do in Maryland that is an underutilized tool is the use of a lifetime Q-tip trust. If we have a couple, or if you are a couple, and you wanted to achieve some very solid asset protection, and you had some significant assets, and you felt that you wanted to um, in, you know, engage in asset protection planning, this is a great way of doing that by setting aside money for your other spouse during lifetime, not just at death, but at lifetime, during lifetime, in a Q-tip trust, lifetime Q-tip trust, and that will, for the right circumstance, give uh, the spouses tremendous asset protection, even though it is a Maryland trust and it's not a trust at death and it's not a domestic asset protection trust. So that's a very uh, little known kind of secret that I want to make you aware of today. And we just talked about a grandchild's trust could be established as like a lifetime gifting trust. And these trusts do not have to be complicated. These are very straightforward trusts. An education trust might be a lifetime trust where you are funding that trust. A charitable trust could be a lifetime trust where you are funding that trust. And of course, any trust that you established for a grandchild or a child or a niece or nephew, that trust could be dynastical. That means it could last in perpetuity with tremendous asset protection on down the line until there's no more money left. Now, typically when you're establishing a trust like a lifetime gifting trust, this is going to be a grantor trust. When you establish a gifting trust for a child or grandchild, you're usually saying, well, I'm going to keep paying the tax on this even though I'm giving this gift to them. And when I pay the tax on any income or dividends, I am actually giving them a little bit more of a gift. So that's a very popular technique and so forth. Whereas charitable trusts uh, are going to be non-grantor trusts. So we don't have time to get in all of those nuances, but I'm just trying my very best today to give you a flavor for these tools and weapons, as I say, for 2023 and 2024. Now, some of you on this webinar have life insurance trusts. 
Now, why did you have this trust? Well, probably you created this trust years ago if you did, and you may have done so when the estate tax exemptions were much lower. And you probably did this on advice of your attorney or financial advisors to remove the value of the life insurance from your estate to put it in that life insurance trust. And if we follow all the guidelines and all of the requirements year to year, we are going to survive an audit if the IRS ever starts auditing again. And we are going to be able to remove the value of that life insurance from our estate, but still have that for the benefit of our uh, spouses or children. So there are first to die, meaning single, single islets, meaning I have a life insurance policy, I put that in a life insurance trust and I'm a single person or I have a single policy and that's designed to hold that policy. Or there are second to die policies where the underwriting is a little bit more liberal. The cost structure might be less because it's underwritten on the life of two people. And it might be that that kind of policy gets put into an irrevocable life insurance trust. So it provides control for the grantor to some degree. It provides asset protection for the beneficiaries. And it also, of course, gets that life insurance out of the estate of the person and also keeps it out of the estate of the surviving spouse, if there is a surviving spouse, and all of the beneficiaries in perpetuity for so long as that money is in that life insurance trust. Now, it can be leveraged. Let's say that a person buys a life insurance policy, has a life insurance in a trust, and the premium, let's say, is X amount of dollars. And let's say it's not a small premium. Well, that person can say, well, I've got uh, you know, two children and I've got three grandchildren and I've got a spouse. You know, I've got five or six or even more beneficiaries of that trust. So now I can make annual exclusion gifts into that trust. And we're gonna talk about that through the crummy powers. I can make annual exclusions gifts into that trust pay the premium, get the 17,000 per person or whatever it may be at that time out of my own name. And I can also hit two or three birds with one stone. I can build up money in that trust if I gift more than the premium, but I'm also basically getting assets out of my name tax-free. So these are things that can be leveraged. Now, people today, why would they use a life insurance trust? Well, there could be new reasons. The estate tax exemptions are coming down. Or it could be that you have an estate tax situation. You have very, very high assets that are above and beyond these exemptions, and you need life insurance to be able to pay the excess uh, a tax that is going to be um, attributed to your estate. Many of you, like I said, are saving tremendous amounts of money in retirement plans. And your children, let's say, who are going to be subject to the SECURE Act's 10-year rule, of, of withdrawal, you may be subject to a lot of, your children, I should say, are subject to a lot of accelerated income tax, and you may find yourself in a need to buy life insurance. That's if you did not do Roth conversions and other types of strategies, uh, of which there are not too many, by the way, but you may find yourself buying life insurance as a wealth transfer tool. So if we do that, we're buying life insurance to replace the income tax our children might have to pay due to the SECURE Act for our large IRAs. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the life insurance itself is not taxed in our estate. So these trusts are usually drafted as grantor trusts for income tax purposes. And for those of you who are taking notes, what does a grantor trust mean? It means that the trust itself is ignored for income tax purposes and the grantor pays any income tax. So I know this is going very fast and furious in the time that we have. Please stop us at any time with questions. Now, a spousal lifetime access trust, or as we in estate planning like to say, SLATs, or we love these acronyms, the S-L-A-T, the SLAT, this is a popular tool for people of higher net worth to be able to use the exemption amounts that they have right now the $12,920,000 exemption, it's going up next year, to use those exemptions now before they go away. And many of the advisors on the call today understand this. Some of you who are not advisors may have heard of this. So this is going to be complicated to think about, but I'm gonna to try to simplify it. Remember, I talked about creating a marital trust at death for a spouse. 
And then we talked about creating a marital trust during life, a Q-tip trust during life. We just talked about that a few minutes ago. Well, with regard to the spousal lifetime access trust, I want you to think about this trust as a trust that would be similar to creating a bypass trust, not at your death, but during life. It's really nothing more than a fancy bypass trust. So a good example of this would be one spouse contributes a large gift, and let's just say it was $9 million, $10 million, $11 million, contributes that asset to a SLAT, a spousal lifetime access trust, and that spousal lifetime access trust is usually going to be a grantor trust, which means it's ignored for income tax purposes. And that lifetime trust, that spousal trust, is for the benefit of the other spouse and children. What this does is allows the spouse that made the gift, it allows them to use their exemption now before it goes away, and if, if it does go away. And of course, the other spouse could do the same thing. We have to make sure that that is done correctly. So this is a very popular technique. Its idea is that the estate tax, which is 40%, is much more onerous and much more worrisome than the income tax. So what did I say earlier about a bypass trust? It only gets one step up in basis at death. It does not get two. So the person who contributes this to a slat is going to give up the step up in basis. But that is considered to be more advantageous than not doing it and having those assets subject to estate tax, especially if the exemption amounts come down. So this is a slat. I wanted to give you the very basics of it. And uh, I know that was a lot in a very quick period of time. <clears throat> Charitable trusts come in different varieties. These are irrevocable trusts. So at this point, I want to stop for just a second and say, I hope, even though I'm throwing a lot of information at you here about the tools and weapons, I'm hoping that you're getting the feeling of what I said at the beginning. Specific purposes for specific trusts. Irrevocable trusts, of course, can be created at death. They can be created during life. But one of the things I want you to think about is, remember, irrevocable trusts are not mysterious. They are trusts that usually have a specific purpose. And that is illustrated here with charitable trust. Here's one of the most popular kinds, the charitable remainder trust. And the IRS lays this out very clearly in the code. And these trusts can be established for various periods of time, five, 10, 15, 20 years or lifetime. They provide a current income tax deduction. I'm gonna give you a good example of this. Um, let's say that you had a low basis stock. You had purchased stock for a very low basis. Uh, it's now worth this much and you're very charitably minded and you uh, wanted to make a gift. Well, you could gift your low basis stock into this charitable remainder trust. You could sell it within that trust. It would actually be tax free. So there's no capital gain because the government wants to encourage you to do this. And now that is going to produce an income and you can be the income beneficiary during your life. You will also get an immediate income tax deduction and uh, your children could be uh, other uh, income beneficiaries uh, after your death. But you can, you can have that income tax uh, uh, provision, excuse me, that income uh, advantage during your lifetime. But when the trust actually goes to charity, that remainder goes to charity. And then that is going to be what we call the charitable remainder. And that is what you're going to get an unlimited charitable deduction on your estate tax. So this is a very, very powerful tool that's been around for a long time, and this is a non-grantor trust. So a charitable remainder trust is a good example of a charitable trust. I'm gonna stop now uh, at this particular slide and take a drink of water before we continue to go on. And I want you to take the next minute to go ahead and just make some notes, gather your thoughts, uh, see if there are questions that you have that are popping up, and we'll start now with the one minute. And the idea here is, you know, I've covered a lot of ground, grantor trust, non-grantor trust, uh, bypass trust, marital trust, uh, irrevocable trust versus uh, revocable trust, uh, trust at death versus trust during life, trust for specific purposes, life insurance trusts, and uh, just taking maybe another 35, 40 seconds here to gather yourself and gather your thoughts.
And it looks like we are on time, so we're going to be efficient here and end on time. Thank you for, again, for attending today. Steve, we have a question here. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Our time is about out. Go right ahead. And from our good friends, Melvin, and question is, can a 1031 rental property be included in an irrevocable trust? I definitely think the answer is yes. Uh, I'd have to look at the specific t a situation, but I believe that I just saw that situation occur, kind of an arm's length transaction from me uh, as I was working with some other lawyers. So I think the answer to that is yes. That's a good question. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And I hope you've gathered your thoughts and made a couple of jot downs and notes. Let's now talk about Medicaid and Veterans Trust. So possibly one of the most powerful uh, conceptual tools today in estate planning uh, in, in the mainstream world is the irrevocable trust for Medicaid. So this is a trust where normally someone is worried about getting funds out of their Medicaid estate. In other words, getting funds out of their estate before a crisis situation occurs for long-term care. So what happens here is uh, the person uh, uh, gifts assets to a trust and that trust is irrevocable and that trust is going to protect from the claims of the beneficiaries creditors. So let's say the children are the lifetime beneficiaries, the children are the death beneficiaries of this trust, but one of the children gets divorced, one of the beneficiary children gets divorced. Well, we don't want mom and dad gifting property into this irrevocable trust, only to have it attacked by the divorcing, divorcing spouse. So these trusts create, uh, protect against that, and they also give the parents, the grantors, they give them a level of control over the assets. So there's no question the assets are gifted, they are divested, so we can start the Medicaid five-year period, which used to be three years. In other words, divesting assets five years in advance of a crisis, ideally. Uh, but uh, there's no question we're making those gifts and, and, and it's a complete divestment. However, the grantor would retain a few powers, the power to uh, change trustees, the power to change beneficiaries at death. And in our, in my opinion, the grantor would also have flexibility and control through a trust protector because the grantor is usually giving away the assets. And if it's a, a house that's involved or residence, the grantor is retaining the right to live in the house. So these can be uh, usually uh, established as grantor trusts so that they retain several things, the step up in basis at death and uh, also uh, their grantor trust because if a residence is sold inside of these trusts, we want the residence to have all, excuse me, the residence that is sold, we want the grantor to have the same benefit of the exclusion from capital gain. So these are trusts that are very powerful and we have people that are not planning for Medicaid that use these trusts only because they like the idea of how these trusts work. Now the Veterans Trust is similar to the Medicaid Trust in that it protects assets, it divests assets away from the eligible veteran, the veteran that is eligible for aid and attendance, what we call a certain type of VA pension and uh, the VA rules changed in 2018, so we have a different set of rules we're working with, but this trust is similar, except it is a non-grantor trust, and it works just a little bit differently, but the idea is to make sure that the veteran divests assets so that they can qualify for the tax-free income of a veteran's pension. Okay, so that is a good example of those Medicaid and veterans trusts. Let's go now back to the marital Q-tip trust, uh, this is, again, the irrevocable trust at death that somebody would establish. They could also establish it during life. Here, we're illustrating that it has two steps up in basis. It protects the surviving spouse from the claims of creditors. Why is that important? Well, remember, many couples enjoy husband and wife, wife-husband protection, meaning spousal protection called tenants by the entireties. But when one spouse dies, there is no tenants by the entireties protection. We only have, as spouses, asset protection when we're now surviving. We have asset protection in our IRAs. We have asset protection in life insurance, asset protection in annuities most likely, but we don't have that tenants by the entirety's protection. So people that are planning uh, for death with, with their spouses may want to use a marital Q-tip trust. And so uh, this is a non-grantor trust. We remember 
This is a trust that has established a death in this example, and it's going to have its own tax ID number, and it's going to pay its own income tax. Now, there are ways of dealing with the income taxation of trusts. We're gonna talk very, very briefly about that, but in concept, the idea that I'm trying to convey here is the advantage of the marital Q-tip trust. I mentioned earlier the bypass trust, sometimes get ahead of myself, and Jeff always says I'm intentionally redundant. So we're intentionally redundant here to drive home this information. A bypass trust is a popular tool, perhaps the person died and left a non-marital trust, the bypass trust, and it gets that step up in basis on the first death, but not the second. It protects the surviving spouse from the claims of creditors, so we give it a big thumbs up for that. It is also, though, something that the deceased spouse can articulate is more controlling over the survivor. So it can also articulate that uh, the survivor must get a prenuptial agreement if they ever die, excuse me, if they ever get married, excuse me, and of course, they're going to die someday after the marriage. But the idea here is that the non, uh, the non, uh, uh, the, the bypass trust, the non-marital trust, is a good tool for those people who either have an extremely large taxable estate, and that could be the reason that we use the bypass trust, or the bypass trust is used because they want to have more marital control or they want children as well as the surviving spouse to be beneficiaries. But right now, even though this is a, um, you know, a non-grantor trust when we die, uh, it is more advantageous, again, for the vast majority of people to use marital trusts instead of non-marital trusts. So we just are trying to illustrate here the advantages of a bypass trust or the disadvantages of it. The grantor retained annuity trust is for a wealthier individual, I think, to be able to transfer assets to an irrevocable trust. And then there is what I would call a tax play, as many of you would imagine. So the tax play is where we have the uh, assets of the trust growing at a faster rate than the IRS 7520 rate. So this is just something I won't spend a lot of time on, but taken to its logical extreme, these types of strategies, which have not been taken away yet, although that's always talked about, these types of strategies can remove significant amounts out of the taxable estate of a wealthier individual if we have the performance of the assets outperforming the IRS midterm or 7520 rate. So that's what this grantor retained annuity trust is. For some people, this is a good tool in the arsenal. The miners trust is a trust that we don't use too much, but it is still out there. And it is a trust for someone under the code that can still be established for someone who's under 21 years of age. Again, the utility of this kind of trust, when you read what it's really about, doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense in my opinion. And I haven't seen this used for, for many, many years, but I wanna make you aware that there is this thing called a miner's trust. Now an education trust, I've had many very sincere clients who are planning in perpetuity for education, or they may just be planning for at their deaths, they're leaving their grandchildren or further descendants uh, an education trust. Now, for the financial advisors and CPAs on the on the call today, we know that there are certain advantages of 529 planning, and perhaps the education trust uh, is kind of uh, eclipsed by the 529 planning, and sometimes not. So this can be uh, multi-generational. It can even have philanthropic uh, 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 strains to it. Uh, and so the tax treatment of this is going to be dependent on how it's designed. But it's very, very nice to know that we can leave an educational trust in our revocable trust or will, or we can establish a standalone educational trust for those that want it to be more multi-generational. So this is something that's very, very nice to uh, be able to do for certain people. Special needs trusts are trusts established for persons with disabilities. These trusts can be revocable or irrevocable during life. And this is basically planning for people who have special needs or disabilities or chronic illnesses. And these trusts become irrevocable at death no matter what. These trusts are designed conceptually to protect the means-tested benefits for beneficiaries, such as the Medicaid system, what we would call uh, the Medicaid waiver programs, and SSI, which is means-tested, where an individual can only have $2,000 in their name of assets and a couple can only have $3,000 
in assets. So the bread and butter type of special needs or supplemental needs plan, as we call it, is a third party trust where a person who is a third party, such as a parent or grandparent, leaves assets into a trust at their death for a beneficiary who has disabilities. That also could be a trust that is funded during life with life insurance and other things. So funding of these trusts is something that is very, very important consideration. But that lifetime supplemental need trust could also be established as an irrevocable trust as well. So you heard me just in the last minute or two use the terms or juxtapose the terms supplemental needs trust with special needs trust. So I'll try to be clear on that. A third party trust is something we would typically refer to as a supplemental needs trust, a third party supplemental needs trust. The money goes from a person who is a third party, like a parent or grandparent, straight to the trust, and it does not go to the person with disabilities. And therefore, the, the law says that that third party trust can hold those assets for the supplemental needs or discretionary needs of that beneficiary without without hurting their public benefits and also protecting them from the claims of creditors and predators and so forth. The first party trust, or what we would call a typical special needs trust, is a trust established under state and federal law since 1993. And this first party trust is a trust where the beneficiary has received money that they should not have received, either from an inheritance or heaven forbid they were injured in a car accident or a birth injury, or a train accident, and now that large settlement, that $10 million or that $4 million, whatever it may be, needs to go into a first party trust, a special needs trust that is regulated by the state government, but that money can be sheltered for the needs of that person without destroying their public benefits and their ability to take advantage of those benefits while having that money in reserve for their special needs. So that's the technical difference between those two types of trusts. Now, objectives of irrevocable trust, special needs trusts. We just talked about this, the third party trust. This is again, the bread and butter of the special needs world. It can be flexible. It has no payback to the state of Maryland. And then the first party trust, this is the trust where there's two basic types. The D4A type, which is the type that is uh, for someone who's under 65 years old, and it can be funded. This is the type that's typically funded from that accident settlement that I just mentioned. The D4C trust is a pooled trust. This is a trust like the Ark of Northern Virginia or a nonprofit like that. So the first party trust has a payback provision. The third party trust does not have a payback provision. It's surprising how many of these trusts we see where all of the terms and provisions are all mixed up and the drafting attorneys did not have it, didn't have it right. Although we do see some that are drafted correctly and, and very well. Uh, we also see many that are not drafted well. So this is something that we need to be very careful of, but special needs trusts can be established during lifetime or they can be established at death. So the special needs, tr supplemental needs trust can live inside of a will or trust, or it can be created during lifetime. Technically speaking, any trust, not just a supplemental needs trust, any trust that's created during lifetime is going to have more utility over the long term for the beneficiary rather than a testamentary trust created at death. However, in the, in the uh, world of special needs planning, the trust that's created inside the will or trust or the trust that stands on its own protects the beneficiary in the same way, exactly the same. It's just a question of the utility of the trust. Sometimes a supplemental needs trust has to be created during life so that other family members, should they die, they can leave assets to that trust. A dynasty trust, or what I would call a bloodline trust, is a trust that is created where it is created to last in perpetuity. So they're created to last at lifetime and to go to the beneficiary's descendants or to a limited class of descendants that could include descendants or a specific spouse that is allowed to be in there or a charity. But what we wanna be careful here is to make sure that the assets remain down the bloodline and what happens here, it freezes assets for estate tax purposes. So it protects the beneficiaries at a very high level, um, but it also allows the assets to grow and never be taxed again, if it's designed properly, never be taxed again for estate tax purposes. So this can last forever, depending on the jurisdiction, 
And Maryland, like many states, has abolished the rule against perpetuities. So a dynasty trust can be created during life. For example, a SLAT, a spousal lifetime access trust, would be a dynasty trust. Um, a, an asset protection trust in Delaware or Nevada, that would be a special power of appointment trust. These would be dynasty trusts, okay? And also, to make it more simple on a more uh, fundamental level, let's say you and I were to die and leave an, as, uh, an asset in trust for a child of ours, and that trust is created to last forever. That is also, in my opinion, a dynastical trust. But in this particular sense, we're talking about an irrevocable trust for a special purpose, and it's usually a standalone trust that is created like a slat that is a dynasty trust designed to last for multi-generations. Domestic asset protection trusts, I just spoke about this. These are self-settled trusts. And by the way, Jeff, I just looked at my clock and it's two, uh, one minute after two, so I think we're on track to finish on time. I'm gonna keep going. Uh, Self-settled trusts, a trust that you and I go into one of these jurisdictions and we say, we're gonna establish this trust and we're going to settle it ourselves. Well, there are only a limited number of these jurisdictions and you'll notice here in the second bullet point, it may afford you asset protection but it needs to be designed properly. And it's usually designed as that dynasty trust or what we call a generation skipping trust. And there are hybrid domestic asset protection trusts, special power of appointment trusts where there are more moving parts to give various independent people powers over your affairs. And in that way, you're enhancing your estate, excuse me, your asset protection. But the gifts that are gifted into these trusts, if they are completed gifts, these gifts are forever frozen. So if a million dollars was transferred to one of these trusts and then it grew to 10 million, that excess 9 million is free of a state tax. It's growing tax free. So we can achieve asset protection with these trusts in some ways, but not necessarily with just the basic self-settled asset protection trust. California, which is a state that doesn't allow much asset protection, uh, they are attacking trusts like this. And we have to be aware that if we establish one, it doesn't necessarily mean we are 100% uh, bulletproof, so to speak, from creditors. So there's a lot of factors, including what types of assets are owned by these trusts. But the more hybrid the trust is, or the more the trust is a special power of appointment trust, the greater asset protection that we have. The Community Properties Trust. Uh, Alaska, Tennessee, and South Dakota. There might be another state now. I, 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 Jeff, I honestly can't remember, but I think it might be Michigan that is allowing a community property trust. So let's say that there was an asset that it was very, very um, low basis asset, and we wanted to make sure that it was treated as a community property asset. Well, in a community property state, it doesn't matter which spouse dies first there is a 100% step up in basis in that asset. So if we use a community property trust, we can achieve a 100% cost basis adjustment, even if we don't live in one of these states. So these are kind of the advanced planning tools that are available to us today. And of course, it has to be a special situation to make this work, considering the cost of the trust, the maintenance of the trust, as to whether it's worth all of that to achieve that 100% cost basis adjustment at the first death, but these types of trusts are available to us. Jeff, I'm gonna stop for just a second to see if there's any questions and take just a sip of water. Thanks, Steve, I do have a couple questions. I was gonna let you get through the list, but now would be a good time right, for sure. You. So first question, uh, pivoting just a bit, can you go through the steps to create a revocable trust? Will the trust have its own federal tax ID number? And can a joint checking account be outside of the trust? Thank you for that question. So the, uh, I'm happy to do that. So creating a revocable trust, I think, is very much like creating a will. So remember, there are four elements in a will, in my opinion. Who gets my tangible property? Who gets my specific gifts or off-the-top gifts, like uh, a gift to my church or charity or to my grandchildren? or a special provision. I have a second home. I want to keep that in a trust. You know, so we have our tangible property, we have our specific gifts, and then we have the balance of the estate called the residual estate. And then we have the ultimate beneficiary. 
what happens if no one is living and all of our plans went up in smoke? Uh, there was a disaster, which is probably never going to happen. But those four elements are what you would normally do to create a will or a trust. So the counseling issues there are basically the same. And then it's really going to be a question of just going through a few meetings to um, kind of design it, whether it's a will or a trust. In the revocable trust, we're deciding who trustees are, we're deciding if we're going to use trust protectors, and we're deciding on the same things we normally would decide on. Is there going to be a marital trust if you're if you're married? Is there going to be further trust for this for the beneficiaries, or is it going to be outright distribution? Uh, do we have any business assets? You know, how are we going to fund the trust? So where I'm going with that is the first step is to design the revocable trust through a series of counseling meetings and just back and forth in a discussion. The second part is is funding the trust or aligning our assets. We want our non-retirement assets to go into the trust, generally speaking, uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, savings bonds, uh, cash, money market, all of those things go into the trust, our residents, but our retirement plans stay outside the trust, and generally speaking, life insurance would stay outside the trust. Once we have that in place, we have designed the trust, we've funded the trust, and now you would have a trust that actually works. Now, to your second question, we have the issue of your saying, can I leave a joint account outside the trust? And the answer is absolutely yes. If you have a joint account, you don't want the trust to control that account. You can leave it outside the trust and it will pass by operation of law, obviously. And then the third thing, uh, Jeff, I apologize. I can't remember the third question. Can a joint checking account be outside of the trust? Well, yes. So that joint account can be outside, but I thought there was another question. Um, can, a, can a trust have its own federal tax ID number? Oh, yes. Thank you for that. So the revocable living trust is a grantor trust, just like I mentioned earlier. So here's the trust. Here is you. And here's Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam is going to ignore the trust as if it doesn't exist, because why? It is a grantor trust and it is identified by your social security number. So that's a great question. The difference between the revocable trust and the irrevocable trust that is created as a grantor trust is that the irrevocable trust that's created for a grant as a grantor trust will typically have its own tax ID number. But your revocable trust, which is just a substitute for a will, is going to be identified by your social security number until the death of one spouse or until your death if you're a surviving spouse. And now it's going to have its own tax ID number, but only after the death of the grantors. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay, and we have one more. Um, again, a little outside the box here. Can you expand upon long-term care insurance and the best recommendation to protect assets so that if a spouse gets ill, they don't have to sell their own property or deplete all assets? She then goes on to say, premarital agreement listed the property and asset accounts of Roth IRA and inherited IRAs before marriage. All right, I'll do my best in the interest of time to answer that very succinctly. So your premarital agreement may have nothing to do, depending on the jurisdiction you're living in at the time of a long-term care issue. It may not help to be able to preserve any assets. Now, long-term care insurance uh, and, and our financial advisors and other advisors on the call here are going to be more expert in the actual minutia. But I'm going to say from an estate planning point of view, one of the major elements of estate planning to plug is exactly what you're talking about, is the possibility of a loss of assets due to long-term care costs. So we have traditional long-term care policies that have come under fire. We have hybrid policies, and you're going to want to talk to your financial advisor about that. And if you don't have a financial advisor, we're going to help you get connected with someone who can help advise you along these lines. And also, if you're insurable, you may be able to have a long-term care rider on your life insurance as a, a way to deal with long-term care. So once a person kind of evaluates all that, you're going to be much more in the knowledge of what you need to do. Now, for people who don't have long-term care insurance, there are legal remedies, and this is where the world of elder law comes in, to be able to do Medicaid strategies and so forth. So obviously, long-term care insurance are getting yourself ahead of a Medicaid crisis or a, of a nursing home crisis, by starting to think about five-year divestment, should I divest my assets five years in advance if I have the right planning situation? 
Uh, so all of this has to do with having the right documents in place, having flexibility in place, having an elder law consultation to kind of flesh out your goals about uh, asset protection, talking to your financial advisor about long-term care or hybrid long-term care policies or an insurance policy. Thank you for that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the interest of time now, I'm going to forge ahead. A domestic asset protection trust, excuse me, a qualified domestic trust is what I'm trying to say, is going to be used when we have spouses where one of the spouses is a non-citizen spouse. So Uncle Sam does not want a non-citizen spouse to receive money from the deceased spouse, be able to go off to their home country and escape a state tax. So if we want the surviving spouse who happens to be a non-citizen spouse, if we want them to be able to take advantage of the marital deduction and the deceased spouse to be able to take advantage of the normal marital uh, deduction and that type of arrangement, we want to uh, basically plan for that in the documents. Now, whether or not someone is a non-citizen or a permanent resident and all of that is going to depend on whether or not, uh, that that is going to depend whether or not they have an estate tax exemption and so forth. So all of this has to do with estate tax planning when someone is a non-citizen spouse. So this is something that we have to address in estate planning where we have that situation. The Qualified Personal Residence Trust, as I mentioned, this is a tool. So someone can create a trust that has a term and that term could be five, 10, 15, or 20 years. And depending on the value of that residence and depending on the term, depending on whether it's five, 10, 15, or 20 years, depends on whether or not that trust is going to provide the appropriate discount. So let's say someone transfers a second home into a trust, it's for 15 years, and that, tr uh, that house is worth a certain amount, it gets transferred into the trust. If that person who is the grantor of that tr trust, the donor, if they survive the 15 year period, and then after the trust is, is, is terminated, so to speak, if they continue to pay rent, they pay rent for their own residence. So this is a technique, and if it's successful, what happens is it, it's successful in transferring the residence or the second residence to the children, let's say, and they do it at a discounted rate where they only have to use a discounted amount of their gift tax exemption. So this is something that's out there. It's something we can still use, but we don't see it too often, although I think it's still very much a viable strategy. Many grantors don't want to pay rent after the term of the trust ends. A crummy trust. Many of you know what this is, but there was an actual man named Mr. Crummy. Uh, I understand he had many, many children and grandchildren. I read his case when I was in law school in, uh, in the LLM getting my degree. And Mr. Crummy said to the IRS in the 1960s, he said, when I make a gift to my life insurance trust, I should be able to use my annual exclusion. And I should be able to use it for every single beneficiary. And I want to say Mr. Crummy had 13 or 14, maybe even 16 or 17 beneficiaries. So Uncle Sam disagreed with him and said, oh, no, you can't do that. And finally, they said, yes, you can, provided that the beneficiary has, an, has a present right to the money. So in other words, if you make an annual exclusion gift to a trust, you're making a gift to that trust for a group of beneficiaries, and you're making a, a, an annual exclusion gift for each one of those beneficiaries. But if you give them a present right of withdrawal, now it's going to qualify for the annual exclusion. So that's called the crummy trust or the crummy notice or the crummy power. And that's a powerful tool to make sure that if we are making gifts to trusts, that we can use our annual exclusion. If it's a life insurance trust, we're using our annual exclusion to get money into the trust tax free without having to um, you know, waste that. So that is something that we are going to be very upset at those beneficiaries if they exercise their right of withdrawal. But after their right of withdrawal is over, uh, we have successfully put our assets in there and used our annual exclusion. The quiet trust. Maryland does not technically have a quiet trust, but Delaware and some other states do. This is a trust where, unlike Maryland, where beneficiaries are absolutely uh, entitled to information, they're absolutely entitled to an accounting and a copy of the trust. Um, this is something where the beneficiary does not have those same rights. So being quiet or having a quiet trust is uh, important to some people. It's important to know that that technique exists 
even though we really can't practically accomplish that in Maryland. And lastly, a standalone retirement plan trust is a trust that I would say is a conduit. It is something that can receive a large IRA, and in doing so, uh, the person who might have this large IRA says, I want to encourage my beneficiaries to segregate these assets off and, and consider them separate. I'm not going to leave my IRA into a trust where I have other non-IRA assets. I'm not going to mix those assets up, even though it's possible to do that. This person says, I'm not going to mix those up. I'm going to keep those IRA assets separate because I want to make sure that they're treated separately. Now, since the SECURE Act has happened and we have the issue of the 10-year rule that the IRA has to be drained, it has to be taken within 10 years, unless the person who's receiving the IRA is one of the five exempt persons, a spouse, minor children, people who are less than 10 years younger than the beneficiary, a chronically ill person, or a person with disabilities. Unless it's one of those five exemptions, then the person is going to have to take the assets out in 10 years. So whether or not a standalone retirement plan trust still makes sense, and remember we have the issue of, should we keep assets in trust from a retirement plan? Well, the answer is no, we don't want to accumulate them inside of a retirement plan unless we have to, unless it's a special needs trust. We don't want to accumulate those assets unless it's a special needs trust or unless there's a creditor out here that can get those assets because it's going to subject those assets to a 37% tax rate. However, we still want to consider on a case-by-case -case basis when we have large IRAs, uh, should we use a standalone retirement plan trust or not? Now, irrevocable trust taxation, and then we will wrap up. Uh, grantor trust, remember, a grantor trust is a trust where the grantor pays the tax. A non-grantor trust is like the trusted death or a lifetime trust like a charitable trust. These, these trusts pay their own tax. The tax reporting is done in various ways, and, and that's beyond the scope of this discussion. But the most important thing I could uh, maybe pass on to you if you haven't heard of this and you can work with your attorney or your CPA about this. When we have a non-grantor trust, a good example would be a trust for someone at death, and that trust is earning dividends and interest. Well, if we just leave the income, the dividends and interest inside that trust, it's going to pay too much tax. So what usually happens, these assets are distributed out, and you'll see the bullet point that says, carrying out the income to the beneficiary, that's called DNI, the distributable net income. And that means that the beneficiary will bear the income tax at usually their lower tax rate. So don't be afraid to leave assets to a trust because there are ways of dealing with the income tax that have to do with the financial advisor and the attorney and the CPA working together to manage trust taxation. So this issue of trust taxation is beyond the scope of today's discussion, but I at least wanted to talk about it. The, the grantor trust, like a revocable trust, the grantor just pays the income tax. A grantor trust like a spousal lifetime access trust, same thing, the grantor pays the income tax. But when we have a trust at death, a non-grantor trust, for, let's say, that trust is going to have to deal with its own income taxation, and it's going to have to be a proactive relationship to manage the trust taxation. And then lastly, perhaps, flexibility. So we want to build flexibility into trust, the ones that we're creating now. And those flexibility features might in include special fiduciaries like trust protectors, independent trustees, special fiduciaries like investment advisors and distribution advisors. Um, powers of attorney could be enhanced to give powers that have to do with trusts. So we have to make sure that we're dealing with trust assets outside the trust, assets in the trust, uh, because it all has a way of somehow working together sometimes in various situations. And decanting, Maryland now has a new decanting law, and decanting is a very, very strong power in estate planning, perhaps the strongest power, to actually be able to change one trust into a new form of a trust. Maryland's decanting law is quite broad, and so it's something that we need to continue to educate ourselves on because it became effective October 1st. And then older trusts, as we think through this, many times have no flexibility, and that's why we want to look to the terms of the trust. Can we modify this trust, or do we have to use techniques like the non-judicial settlement agreement, decanting, or other court modification or reformation 
And does the a power of attorney, the person who is a, an agent under a power of attorney, do they have any modification powers? So we have to look to all these things to deal with older trusts that might not have any flexibility. So always remember that irrevocable trusts are there. They're, they're there for special purposes to satisfy a goal to get us from point A to point B. They may provide asset protection or other various benefits. They have tax aspects. Uh, you're going to need an advisory team. We highly recommend you have a financial advisor and a CPA along with your attorney. Uh, we want to build in flexibility, hopefully. And if it's an older trust, we want to see if we can add any flexibility through the modern techniques that are available. Uh, we want to determine whether the client wishes to contain, excuse me, to retain any control. And we want the advisory team to support you in making sure that these things actually work the way you envision. So we want to make sure that clients have the space to think. We want to get ready for the ride in 2024. We want to make sure we're ready if the estate tax changes occur. Um, we want to work together if we are advisors. And if you're a potential client or a client on this webinar, uh, we want to make sure that we are communicating as an advisory team to support you and facilitate your planning that actually works the way you want. So we want to be here for you. Uh, Jeff will provide a way for you to set an appointment with me or another attorney here at Elville & Associates. We want you to complete an estate planning questionnaire if you've never done that, because we want you to know uh, that we know everything about you. And one of the things that is very difficult for some people is to relax and share information with people who are strangers. And we completely understand that. So remember, there's nothing to fear when you allow us to review an existing document that you have or you are designing a new one because there is an attorney-client privilege there's an attorney-client relationship and uh, that attaches even if you just come and consult with us even if you don't engage us as lawyers which we hope you do and we hope to meet you and we want to see your current estate plan the basic plan the more advanced documents if you have any as i mentioned earlier we want to help you have an advisory team and we want to see your questions. Those of you who ask questions today, we really appreciate it. It makes the presentation much, much more enjoyable. And overall, and most importantly, we want to give you the time to think in this very busy world to determine what your goals are. And if you don't know what your goals are, to allow you to have an epiphany to determine what those goals actually are. So I thank everybody. Uh, Jeff, it's 2.23. I think we still are on time. And um, I wish everyone uh, a great rest of the week. Thank you for taking the time on a busy midweek day. Have a wonderful weekend ahead and get ready for the holidays like Jeff has. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'll turn it back to you. Well, thanks, Steve. A lot of really great information in an hour and 23 minutes. So thank you so much. Um, Steve, that's your last webinar of the year. Can you believe it? Is that right, Jeff? I want to do another one. It is. Well, we can probably arrange that, but... Um, we're going to give you a little time off until January 3rd. So um, now would be your time to get any final questions in to Steve. We have uh, just a few minutes here. Um, as always, I'll send you some the video from today and some additional resources that I hope prove helpful to you. I'll have that out to you by tomorrow morning. Um, you know, it's hard to believe um, that it seems like yesterday that I was saying, welcome to our first webinar of the year. I want to introduce Kelly Nelson of Maryland Able. Um, that seems like yesterday that I was doing that. And uh, next Tuesday, I'll be introducing our final webinar of the year, which is Tuesday at 1030, which is Thriving Through the Holidays, a celebration of gratitude, part of our wellness series we're bringing back with Dr. Michelle Fritch. She's a nationally renowned speaker, uh, a wonderful presenter, and a great friend to our firm. It's a great way to end our webinar series on a high note for the year. Uh, giving you some great strategies um, to go into the holidays. So uh, we'll be jumping back into it with some of our more popular presentations in January, starting on January 3rd with our estate planning and elder law essentials. And then in February and March, we have a lot of great new presentations to offer you and are really excited about that. Um, so uh, with that said, um, I know uh, Hanukkah starts on Friday and then we've got Christmas and other celebrations coming up. So whatever it is that you're doing, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and we appreciate you being a part of Elbow and Associates and our webinar series. Anything we can do for you, of course, uh, reach out to us um, through our survey, email me, email Steve, contact us uh, through our 
uh, to the phone and uh, always happy to be a resource to you. So thanks for being part of it. And um, looks like we have a question or two here, or maybe just a comment. Um, Steve, I apologize. We do have a webinar on Friday. All right, Jeff. I did. Right. I, I forgot about that. I was jumping the gun. So everybody's well, saying, there's a webinar, there's a webinar. I know you intentionally, you intentionally did that, Jeff, to raise anticipation. I intentionally did that because it's about intentionalism, Steve. Okay. <laughs> Understood. Everybody, I'm so sorry. That's the first mistake I've made all day. That's all right, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Friday, 10 o'clock, Achieving Perfection for Your Legacy, Intentionalism in Estate Planning, one of our also very popular presentations. Friday, 10 o'clock, be there. And then we have our final webinar of the year. I'll be saying the same thing over on Friday. <laughs> That's okay. okay. With that being said, everything I said still rings true. So have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for being part of the Elva webinar series. I'm gonna edit that last part out. Have a great day. <laughs>